Good evening. Tonight is the Cape Elizabeth School Board Business Meeting of November 8th, 2005. Henry, would you join me with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number one, adjustments to agenda. We have a, uh, <clears throat> what is this? This is, this is the new documents in front of them, and then this is the actual. Okay. Uh, as a matter of information, there are new documents in front of everyone. The first is the town council budget schedule. The second is proposed school department budget schedule and budget workshop schedule. Three is the revised path parts one and two budget addendum. Four is policy IGA, curriculum development and adoption. Five is IKB, policy IKB homework with a change. And is that a second reading? That's the first, first reading. reading. First reading. Um, and six. But the IGA is the second reading. Right. IGA is the second reading. And number six is a letter regarding project graduation. Adjustments to the agenda. Project graduation request under new business. And two, the budget schedule for the year 2007 under new business. Um, do we have students in touch with this project graduation? No, no, we have no one here with it. Okay, good. I'll report on it. Good. I thought one. Of the do I do we? Uh, yeah, I thought one of the parents. Yep, we do. We do. Okay. If we do, I'd like to move that up. So. Is that acceptable to everyone? Mm -hmm. I'll move that up to uh, number three B before communications. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Thank you. Approval of the October school board minutes. May I have a motion to approve? Move. Thank you, Henry. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Any conversation? All in favor? That's how many of us are there? Five. One, two, three, four, five. Five zero to me. Um, 3B um, will be the project graduation request. Who's here to speak to that? And looks like we lost the microphone somewhere. That's okay, I have a loud voice. Okay. <laughs> My name is Martha Palmer. I live at Seven Pilot Point Road. Um, I am the treasurer, no, the secretary of the project graduation committee this year. We are in kind of an awkward position, which I've tried to explain in the letter. Um, we are trying right now to plan the project graduation activities, which will take place following graduation in June. They go through the night. We keep the, the graduates very busy. Um, and we are requesting permission to travel out of state. Uh, we had the same conversation last year at this time with a request from Project Graduation, which was the first time the students had traveled out of state. Um, I don't see why we couldn't approve this this evening as, as, with a motion. I, I know think, we, I our, we the questions were at that time were regarding the insurance, and Pauline had. Um, answers for us regarding the insurance when the students leave the state and what the program was going to be. Um, so some of those things needed to be clarified first, but it was something that we did approve. Yeah, the, the, um, the point of information, the plan to go to Boston last year 
was developed before it came to us, as I recall, mm -hmm. and it was after the fact that the issue came up. And the conversation at the time, which is, no, you know, may no longer be germane, was that we would no longer allow um, out-of-state trips because of um, supervision of student issues. Jeff, do you is Jeff here? Yes. Um, my recollection is that the resolution of the insurance question was that um, if the board, are, that, that uh, and I think that's why Martha is here today and the request is here today, is because the notion was that you would treat this as a field trip request for an out-of-state visit, and if you approve it as an out-of-state field trip, then insurance does cover the trip. I'm not concerned about the insurance piece. I'm concerned about the administrative conversation around supervision last year. So I guess what I'm asking you, Jeff, and I'm going to put you right on the firing line, is do you do or do you don't agree with this request? <laughs> what? Um, I, to be very honest with you, I'd rather, I would rather not take that position. Um, um, it's, I will tell you what my concerns are, and I stated them last year, and I'll state them this year without a state request. It's not so much the supervision issue is one issue. For me, the bigger issue is, having been through precisely this cycle in another school district, is when you begin to go out of state, the tendency is for each group to sort of want to go to different, farther away locations. Um, I'm trying to be careful about how I answer this question, partly because I don't want to, this, um, because we're on TV and this, the, the plan of this trip is supposed to be a secret one. Um, those, those concerns are not enormous with this trip, but I, I am just concerned about, and I've expressed this to the project graduation people, it's not a surprise for Martha to hear me say this, that I, those still continue to be my concerns about how, how workable. This is not so much for this particular trip, but I just am concerned about what happens next year and the following year. Um, having my personal experience was having at another school spent 36 hours walking around a Six Flags in New Jersey <laughs> on a trip from Maine. It was one of the most depressing nights <laughs> I've ever spent as a school administrator. Now this is not that, so we are not there. I, I just want to sort of raise a caution flag. Um, most of the conversation that happened last year happened with Bob Lyman. Uh, Alan, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I have rece been receiving information on and off from the parents group. Uh, again, what they had asked for originally was a uh, executive session so we could talk about it. Mm -hmm. This doesn't fit under the law, I couldn't do that. So what they have done, and we've had, we had an exchange of two letters today. Correct. <laughs> One letter to me which talks about the actual trip. Mm -hmm. The second letter taking the actual trip out of it so that it doesn't become public knowledge, not because there's anything wrong with it, but because of students mm -hmm. and the concerns. With my discussions and what I have for information, both directly and through my secretary, is that this trip is appropriate uh, and is within the confines of what we would like to see as far as distance is concerned. Is that fair for me to say it that way? I think so. Yeah. I, mean, I, I actually was one of the supervisors on the trip last year, and I can't imagine a better way to keep the graduates contained. You have them on a bus for four hours, and the particular venue that we are looking at um, is self-contained. So it, um, it's, it's a very easy way to supervise and it offers something for everyone in the group. It was a wonderful experience. We didn't hear one negative comment about the program last year. We haven't finished our planning this year. Our committee, we're still working on venues. But I think um, we would like to build around this, uh, our particular travel opportunity if we are allowed to. I recognize Jeff's concerns about it moving into sort of a, another realm, but I think that we can you know, remember that going forward with future years graduation projects and it's not as though the administration won't be seeing the plans down the road for the years and 
you know, given that, I don't really see out-of-state travel as, for this as being any different than all of the other out-of-state travel that, that we do for, for other activities. And my other, so I, think, I would support this. I think, I don't know if you were the one who said it or someone said it who called my office is, there is no intent to be, this become a competi competition of bigger and better every year. Not so at all. I mean, we, we carefully reviewed the, the, the travel last year, the venues, and, and really seriously looked at what worked and what didn't work. But there's no interest, I think, on anyone's part to uh, go further afield. I, in fact, was a person who drove my car last year and stayed up all night because we felt like it was important to have an automobile in case something happened. And I was really tired when I got home in the morning. So I don't think anyone would have any interest in going much further afield than a couple of hours anyway. I, I just have one other question. Um, the, the number of chaperones assigned to the number of students is set by the project graduation committee, or does that have input from the administration? I'm just curious as to how that was handled. It isn't a question I know the answer to, but perhaps Jeff does. Um, it's, it's never been an issue, and I, I, I wouldn't have a, a concern about that. There's always been plenty of adult chaperones um, on all the project graduation trips that I've been on since I've been here. I don't know the specifics of this one, but I have no concern about that at all. Okay, I just... Are there any other questions? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the project graduation trip right. uh, as an out-of-state field trip. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? And well, any comment, further comment? None? All those in favor? Thank you. Martha, thank you. Under communications, we have a number of topics, uh, specifically a report on the MSMA conference, student voice, summary of uh, fall sports. But I also believe we have board members who would like to recognize uh, certain student and student groups. Uh, so that will be included as well. Um, Elaine and Ann, the report on the MSMA fall conference. Either one of you. Well, I thought we had, I, I didn't think that we were actually even a report on our workshops since we've shared that information amongst <coughs> all of us. I'm not sure that people out there are really interested in hearing the details of the workshops we attended. No, I think the un understanding was just an acknowledgement that you attended the okay, workshops. Okay, so I attended workshops, as did Elaine. Thank you. Uh, middle school, student voice. What you have in your packet is the student voice from Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Uh, introduction with uh, an article about the new principal, who I don't know that he considers himself new anymore, but uh, about Mr. Conley. Also, several very well-written articles by the students at the middle school. And so this is an opportunity for you to see this. If you haven't, if you're a parent, you may have seen it, uh, and see some of the work that is going on at the middle school level. Summary of fall sports. I've put into your packet a letter from Keith Weatherby on the fall athletic season. What it talks about basically is the following. Sport, girls soccer, varsity, JV, and freshmen. Number of participants were 53. The varsity record was 8, 6, and 3. And they lost in the Western Maine semifinals. Soccer boys, varsity, JV, and frosh, 62 participants. Varsity record was 6-5-5 five, and five, and they lost in the Western Maine quarterfinals. Field hockey, varsity, JV, and Frosch, 53 participants. Uh, their record was 8-8 eight and eight and lost in the Western Maine quarterfinals. Football, varsity and JV, 50 players, 5-4 to four record and had the best season Cape Elizabeth ever had in football. Golf, 30 tried out, 12 participated. Varsity record was 9-1, to one, and they won the Western Maine Conference, Western Maine Regionals, and the state championship, which will also be reported in a few minutes from now. Girls cross country, there are 18 participants. The varsity record was 11-1. to one. Western Maine Conference, Western Maine Regionals, and they also are state champions. 
And the boys cross country, there were 22 participants. Uh, their record, varsity record was 12 to zero. Western Maine Conference, Western Maine Regionals, and state champions. Total number of participants this fall in high school sports was 270 students. Just a note about golf, Raputuk allows us to have 12 players on the course. They do not charge us for the use of the golf course. Uh, from the middle school, boys soccer had 40 who participated, cross country had 65, field hockey 35, girls soccer 40, and tennis 25. The total number of participants from middle school this fall was 205, which I think both of these speak well for the number of students who participate in our athletic programs in the fall season. And my understanding is it is as good, if not better, in the winter season. Trish. Um, yeah, the board would just like to publicly congratulate and recognize some student achievements and actually a few staff achievements. Um, congratulations to the Cape Elizabeth High School boys and girls cross country teams who are both state class B champions as Alan mentioned. And this is the first time in over 20 years that both teams have won at the same time. Um, congratulations again to the Cape Elizabeth High School golf team who are the state class B champions. Congratulations to the Cape Elizabeth Middle School girls cross country who became league champions in the Triple C this year. Congratulations to Marie Hayes for orchestrating a school-wide artistic welcome to the Ponco visiting author last week. Um, congratulations to the Cape Elizabeth High School Concert Choir, Symphony Band, and Wind Symphony for their concert in the Cape Elizabeth Gym last Thursday, November 3rd. Got excellent reviews. And congratulations to the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Drama Club for their presentation of Donovan's Daughters last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thank you, Trish. Any other members with comments? If not, I will beg your indulgence. Um, tonight is my last meeting, uh, or business meeting, as chairperson of this group. Um, I've had a good run of 18 months working with good people. And I believe we've had a uh, overall good time, but I'm not going to enumerate the accomplishments and achievements of the last 18 months because I don't do anything myself. I'm simply, in the end, just a single vote. And it's the board that makes the decisions um, that move this school district forward. But it certainly has been a pleasure, if not always fun, um, to fulfill the role as chair. Um, it's bittersweet. It's been an expensive proposition. I think, as most of you know, I have been battling a chronic permanent condition that has no cure and trying to do justice to maintaining my own health while trying to do the board work as well as trying to maintain all the other things that all of us do in life. So um, the end of this term comes to an unhappy conclusion. Um, I certainly have been cross with people as I've dealt with my issues. And I want to thank the generous, generosity and the spirit of the folks on the board for putting up with me during this time. Back when I first ran for election, I had a piece of paper in my, my wallet. And this is a true story. Um, that said, it's about the kids, stupid. It's not about you. And sometimes ego gets in your way. But I plan on spending the rest of my term um, on this school board getting back to basics and working on the things near and dear to my heart, which are projects that directly involve um, the kids. And I'm going to try and stay away from the adult issues that uh, tend to pollute what we try and do for kids. Um, I wish I still had that piece of paper, but I don't. I lost that, and I guess I lost the theme at some point in time. But in any event, I'd like to say thank you. I've enjoyed working with you. I appreciate, appreciate everyone's support. And I know that uh, we will have a very capable person filling this seat. Um, when we have our next election of chair and vice chair. So that's it. Thank you very much. 
The next item is uh, comments from the public on non-agenda items. No? In that case, I'd like to ask the board's indulgence. Apparently, we do have another presentation which would be best served now rather than its position, and that is Kerry Curtis, item 12C, being moved up to the agenda now before we move on to recognition. Is that acceptable? Yes. Thank you. Where are we? Where did I miss it? Can't see. Middle school student voice. Oh. Right. We will go back to the comments by the high school and middle school students, I think, in a moment. My bad. <laughs> Gary, do, how long do you need? Uh, not very long, depending how many questions you all have. Okay. <laughs> Let's go back to the students then, and then we'll, we'll cover sure. your issue. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite the high school students up to report to us. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, representatives from both the No on One and Yes on One campaign came and gave speeches. And um, what happened with Michael Heath was kind of notable. Um, he's from the Yes on One campaign, the Christian Civics League. And um, he gave a speech in the cafeteria, which was followed by a question and answer session. And it really got all the students engaged. It was meant mostly for the seniors, um, some of whom are 18 and would be voting. But all the students got really involved. Um, they asked him questions all the way outside. Mr. Shedd will tell you he was there. Uh, the students followed him all the way out, almost to the parking lot, to ask him questions. Um, so I think it got a lot of students, not just the seniors, really interested in the upcoming elections. Um, which was a good thing. Um, a lot of students ended up writing letters and emails um, to Michael Heath and the Christian Civics League. Um, respectful letters, um, but it was definitely good to get that interest. And um, so I think a lot more students turned out to vote today than would have originally. Um, we had the elections at our school, as you probably know, and the journalism class, and I believe the senior government class, it might have been AP or honors, I'm not sure, um, did an exit poll and a mock election at the school, and the results of that are going to be printed in the next issue of the school newspaper, um, which will come out in a month or so. The last one just came out a couple days ago. And so, Daly? Okay. Um, along with those two presentations, there was also a presentation from Spanish teacher Mrs. Coulter's dad about his experience in World War II. That was interesting, a lot of people like that. And with the uh, uh, championship teams, a lot of kids were excited and it probably brought some prestige to the school too. And there's a 5v5 football tournament going on, which people get excited about and there's good spirit and probably shows a lot that school isn't all business. And uh, with the dance controversy, it's been suggested that we have more activities. And there are plans for a bowling night this Thursday, but there was lack of interest and it got canceled. And the, but the freshman class is still planning on having another dance. And so we are having Steve Wessler come in and he's going to talk about sexual harassment and then we're going to have uh, I think round table discussions anyway tomorrow he's coming in and he's going to get some focus groups let me think three focus groups of 25 students to see what everybody feels about it and what the issue is and he'll figure out uh, a plan of action maybe that's probably what he's doing and um, and yeah, and then we'll pr most likely have roundtable discussions, which would get uh, 
there'd be some intergrade communication where people would, where younger grades could talk to older kids and get to know, maybe get some self-esteem to like stand up to them, and also let everyone know what's appropriate and inappropriate. That's it. I'm sorry, I missed that day. When is Steve Wessler coming? He's going to come in tomorrow and uh, plan things out. I think that's what's happening. Yeah. Oh, to, plan to, he's, to plan things, he's coming tomorrow? He's speaking tomorrow, Jeff. Sorry for confusion. He's, he's meeting with three focus groups of 8 to 10 students each in preparation for his presentation to the school at a later time. Um, we're still, the freshman class, I think, is still trying to figure out whether the December 3rd dance date is going to work for them. Tentatively, he's scheduled to come um, November 18th, but I've been talking to him about the possibility of putting that off a little bit later, depending on what happens with that dance date, which I should know tomorrow. But he's not speaking to the entire student body tomorrow. He's just okay. doing some preliminary work, talking with students, and figuring out how he wants to frame the later discussion with the entire student body. So would you send that information out to us when he's going to be speaking to the whole? Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. I, I'd just like to comment to the high school students. Um, uh, congratulations and thank you for coordinating a, a response to some of the issues that your class has had during the dances, whether it be the high school forum or the SAC or listening to the parents at the parents association meeting and working with the administration. It really I, I think it starts to show some of the positive effects that student empowerment at the high school can have. Um, and, I, and I just think it's a great movement. So um, thanks for taking the time to work all that out and come up with a solution. Sure. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks, guys. Right, thanks. Middle school students? Good evening. Um, my name is Jack Fisher. Um, the fifth and sixth grade were originally scheduled for a social tomorrow, but uh, at Happy Wheels, but it was canceled due to lack of interest. Uh, Seventy-five kids needed to attend, and about fifty-one um, signed up. The fifth grade student council elections are coming up pretty soon. Um, there's a big amount of interest in that. Um, the WMGX food drive still continues. The collection dates are the 14th. Um, the fifth grade is in the lead with the most interest in it, and the winning grade is, in, um, is entered into a pizza party. Their homerooms are entered into a pizza party, and whichever homeroom is, is drawn gets a pizza party. Um, that's about it for the month. Thank you. Hi, my name is Will Daly. I'll be reporting on the seventh and eighth grade. Well, first of all, the seventh graders came back from Kiev, and everybody seemed to enjoy that, and it was a big success. Um, and laptops are being used pretty well. People use them for research and projects and pretty much anything every day. Um, we have two new uh, teachers this year, including Mr. Connolly, um, but also Mrs. Razi, who will be taking Mrs. Kinsella's place, and Mrs. Mrs. Runner, who is working in the art department now. And they really seem to fit in well with the seventh grade. They both have advisories, and people really seem to like them. Um, the eighth grade will be re revising the uh, iSearch forum to make it more easier, and I think a little bit more exciting for the, uh, for the eighth graders. Um, and also, the eighth graders are working with the MISTEM math program, which is the main impact study of technology in mathematics on their laptops in their math classes. Uh, the phys ed department is working on a personal health web page. They can go to the link by accessing the web page on our website, the middle school website. And I'll just have like different exercises you can do and what muscles and what part of the body it helps you out when you do that exercise. And uh, winter sports are starting. Those include basketball and cross country skiing now. And a little bit later on, they're swimming in dirt track. And I'll also noted. Next week, 7th and 8th graders will be uh, taking a bus to the main, su Southern Maine Honors Band tryouts. And uh, I think quite a few people are going to try out for that. 
I had a question actually about the fifth and sixth grade social that was canceled due to supposedly lack of interest. I was just wondering if, if, if we really know that that was lack of interest or was that lack of notification? Um, like, did, could the kids sign up for that on their own or did that require parental? Um, I think you had to get a signature from your parents, but um, a student on the student council is in sixth grade and he interviewed a lot of his um, fellow students and there surprisingly was a huge lack of interest in it. I think uh, four people said that they wanted to go or something like that and um, we were really surprised. I think it's just that um, a lot of pe people didn't really know about it, a lot about it, because um, when we went we had a great time. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's what I wonder. But um, it's a shame that the fifth grade won't get to, um, hopefully they'll have one next year. But. Yeah, thank you. And now, Kerry. Uh, my name is Kerry Curtis. I'm a science teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School, and I'm also the uh, boy and girls head swimming coach. Uh, and I'm asking permission, and I guess after being here tonight, I guess I'm asking for field trip permission to go to uh, a training trip, um, an optional training trip. Uh, during uh, winter vacation between New Year's and Christmas on the 27th and 28th and 29th down to MIT and train at their facility and in the process of training down there uh, for three days we'd be doing other uh, excursions to the museum at uh, MIT's campus as well as other scientific things related either to the aquarium or to the science museum so trying to make it a trip where the, we train at a facility. It's one of the top in New England, if not the East Coast, that at the same time uh, do some science-related things. That's, that's my background at the high school. So uh, it's an optional training trip. Uh, all my practices since I've been coaching at Cape Elizabeth over the holidays are optional. Um, I, like think, I think it's, more it's just as important for people to spend time with their family. Uh, the, the way we have it set up is uh, we have about 35 kids or 40 kids signed up on the team. As of right now, 20 or 25 are opting to go with us. Um, uh, we have scholarship money available for people who can't afford to go, so we have that set up and we're going to be giving some scholarships to some swimmers who need some financial help. Uh, we'll be staying at the Marriott, uh, which is right near MIT, and there'll be numerous chaperones, but beside myself would be Mr. Raymond, the, my assistant coach, and right now I have a volunteer of many parents who are willing to go and help do that, uh, as well as Dr. Efron will be coming down and training with us for a day and taking us a tour of the facility at MIT in the engineering and science department. So um, that was kind of a nice little coup. But, so that's, that's, I'm just asking permission to do that. I think in front of you is our itinerary. Uh, the transportation we would use would be getting permission from parents to allow their sons and daughters to travel with parents on the swim team, me being one of them, and taking kids to and from practices and other events. And that's, uh, we wouldn't be missing any school days, and we tried to keep it at a cost that it would be uh, favorable for a lot of the kids to attend if they chose to. So I just found out today the Science Museum, I talked to someone there that if we go there versus the Science Museum, we'd be $20 cheaper, so that's another $20 off the uh, total package. So it's somewhere around $140 for three days in, in Boston. So uh, I'm just asking permission for that. So, so sorry about getting late to you. I realize we, we're still waiting for everything to confirm everything, and I should have done it earlier, but uh, I forgot I needed permission from the school board. So. So, Carrie, that opportunity has been offered to all 30 to 40 of yes. the kids who are. We had are a meeting with the swim team members in, uh, on Tuesday of last week. And at that point, there was a preliminary sign up of between 20, about 20 kids. And since that, another five have opted to go. And usually over vacation, anyway, since we don't, I don't make my practice mandatory because swimming is a different sport than basketball or hockey where you really need all the players to be there. Uh, we only run about 50% attendance over vacation time for practices as well as Thanksgiving, so I don't have practices over Thanksgiving as well. So we're actually going to be taking more kids than we normally would take on a training trip if we stayed at home. We'll go there for three days, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, come back. We'll train again at Cape Elizabeth on Friday and then on Saturday. So that's just part of our training regime for that winter. So. And the reason I'm asking to do this is my 14th or 15th year coaching, and uh, 
I've never asked for a training tip, but the kids have been bugging me for a long time. And uh, we've really worked hard to really establish a really well-known program. And our kids have done a really, really nice job, both athletically and academically. And I thought they wanted to go to Florida. I think that was kind of too far to go. And uh, it would have cost too much money. And I wanted to go north up to New Brunswick, where there's a 50-meter pool, and that was too cold. So it was like the bear story. So we decided to go somewhere in Boston, where it was closer. So that's what we decided on. So. Kerry, is this in season? Yes. It is. Yes. Is that why it requires our permission? It, what it requires, just so you know, Kerry, yes. we're having a lot of discussions around excursions outside of Maine. Right. Whether it's in the United States or overseas. And some of the issues have been around insurance, et cetera. I just uh, heard about those this past yeah. week from Mr. Weatherby. And so we've done, I've spent a lot of time checking on this. Pauline has also helped me do, go through that process. Uh, what I find is, is that the board, and yours is a good example. You're taking the Cape Elizabeth High School Swimming and Diving Group. Mm -hmm. So I, even though this is not during school session, mm -hmm. it does have to be approved by the board right. because it is the students of the school system that are going. Right. The insurance issues are the ones we've talked about, and I have some answers on that tonight which are going to help you out, okay. is that the answer is, is that uh, our liability insurance, the board's liability insurance, does cover you and the adults who are on the trip mm -hmm. as far as any liability is concerned. Okay. With the exception, and the one thing you do need to do is anyone who is driving their own cars, mm -hmm. they need to contact their insurance company mm -hmm. and get a certificate from their insurance company showing that they have the appropriate coverage so if there were an accident that the liability would be covered there. Okay. That there are, I believe, we have forms at central office, but if, if not, we, there are some forms that you're these drivers insurance companies should provide. That's familiar to me because I've coached other sports right. uh, during the summer months outside the school season and uh, middle school level and the corporations or the, the organization I'm involved with have required that insurance liability from, from the other drivers that are be driving the children. So, so it would be important to get those into probably the best thing is to make sure Jeff has them in his office there so that they're readily available to us. Yeah. And the other issue for anyone going out of state, particularly with kids who are going to be gone for two or three days, mm -hmm. is to make sure you have uh, all the information necessary as far as uh, health insurance is concerned right. and any health issues, which I'm sure you've done anyway. Right. But I just, I'm trying to make a point of that with everyone just so we can be sure everything is covered at the time. Uh, we did, we had uh, the Community services this summer had a very tense uh, few weeks uh, with a group that was overseas. And so we're making very sure that everything sure. is covered before we have groups go. Well, the way that the sports run that we, all the kids, uh, all the student athletes should have their medical forms and insurance policies filled out before the season begins. We'll just make sure that we take duplicates of those with us yeah. just in case anything happens. Exactly. And I'll make sure with my booster club and the parents who are willing to drive and the kids are going to go with them to make sure that we get the proper liability. Uh, references for those just just to cover okay. everybody. So. If I could just make one more comment. Yes. Uh, I took the time today to read this. Yes. I have to compliment you on your team handbook. I, I found it very positive, very clear, very concise on what is expected, how things are done, and that every team member should be taking pride in what they do for Cape Elizabeth. So I do want to compliment Thank you. you. <coughs> So are we voting on this right now? Yes, I guess we might as well. Or do we want to wait until later? I think, I think you can do that tonight. We have no. all the insurance questions are answered. What I, I can also do just to leave the eight, the, make sure that all the responsibilities are done, I can make sure before we leave that all the information goes to Jeff and goes to Mr. Weatherby and also goes to the school board in terms of who will be driving, who will be driving with whom, and making sure that all that work is done in your hands before we take off. Terrific. Well, then I'd like to make a motion that we approve the training trip for the swimming and diving team um, for December 27th, 28th, and 29th to the Boston area. I second the motion. Thank you, Henry. Any further conversation? All those in favor? 5-0. Thank you. Thank Gary. you for bumping me up. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Have a good trip. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is recognition, and there is no one, there's nothing under recognition for a particular purpose. 
Um, there is someone we will be recognizing tonight, and that is Henry Adams. Henry, the board wants to recognize your 18 months with us. You've been uh, a great calming influence, and although you don't say very much, um, when you do speak, it's important. I think we've all enjoyed your company, um, your grace and good humor, and you know we've reached that time. It's uh, it's your last business meeting and probably our last public opportunity to say thank you for being Henry Adams and filling you know this board with. Uh, a lot of good smarts and pleasure. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to present this to you on behalf of the board. Wish you well. We'll miss you at 3 o'clock in the superintendent's office reading emails, but right. um, I'm certain that we'll uh, see each other around town. For myself, Henry, it's been a real pleasure. You know, we only knew ourselves before as town officials, and we would say hello every election day, and that was about the extent of it. But I've really enjoyed my, uh, my time with you, Henry. So uh, good luck in whatever you decide to do next. Thank you. you Thank know, you. I spent, I spent nine years on the town council uh, before I got on the school board, and they're just as different as night and day. Uh, especially money-wise. And 78% of the town budget belongs to the school board. 80% of that money or more goes to wages and salaries. The town council has put a cap on the other end of it. Doesn't give us much wiggle room in between, especially with fuel costs. But having said that, it's off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> And I thank you for that. <laughs> but I, I really have enjoyed my, my, my tenure on the school board, and I, I'm going to miss it. But I'll, I'll watch it on television for a bit. <laughs> a bit. Well, we'd be happy to save any emails that you'd like to come in and read. Save, save, e <laughs> save emails for you, yeah. Save emails for me. Shall I open this? Yes, I think. Probably you should. Is there anyone else? I don't mind at all, as long as it doesn't explode. <laughs> uh, I think I can assure you that it won't. Huh? I think I can assure you that it won't. You do this with Mary, packages. I, I'm sure Mary did that, and well, Mary always does a, a bang-up job of making packages unopenable. That's a word. I didn't save the paper. We normally do that at Christmas time. Now. I have more at CSN. <laughs> <All right. laughs> now you have to get through the box. Now I've got to get in the box. This is all being caught on television. <laughs> and I gotta get into the plastic. <laughs> and I gotta get into the Oh look at the oh. oh my heavens. Isn't that wonderful? Ooh, that's cool. It says Henry C. Adams, member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. June of 2004 to November of 2005, with gratitude, November 8, 2005. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you again, Henry. If there's nothing else, I'll move on to the superintendent's report. Okay. Alan? It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce this evening Phil Coop, who is uh, in the process of establishing his own company called Smart Energy. Phil contacted Elaine, I think, in mid-August sometime talk about the possibilities of looking at one of our schools or possibly more than one of our schools as a prototype for a nonprofit organization to do some work around energy. Uh, Phil has met uh, two times, first with the Finance Committee 
and then has met since then with some, with some other people in the uh, school department. And I asked Bill to come tonight so he could give you, as board members, an overview of what he's talking about and where he's hoping he'd be able to take us uh, in his founding new business. Phil. Thank you, Bill. Should I give copies of the um, sure. paperwork that we've shared? There should be a here. And then do the And I brought extras if anybody wants one. Well, thank you for having me tonight, Alan. Um, my name is Phil Coop. I live at 345 Mitchell Road in Cape Elizabeth. And um, I moved here uh, about a year ago. Um, I was born and raised in Maine, but moved back to my roots after a business career in Washington, D.C. And since coming back, I've, I've, um, I've made a commitment to get into renewable energy. I believe that it's a very important issue of our time. I have three young children of my own, and I'm concerned about their future. And I've decided that um, based on the, the economics of renewable energy systems at present, that a nonprofit is probably the best way to go in terms of bringing renewable energy systems to public schools. And, and that is my goal. I think that by bringing renewable energy, and I'm talking about uh, solar and wind power, by bringing it to the public schools, I think you can accomplish a lot of things. I think you can immediately produce benefits for all, this, for all the residents of the area by reducing consumption of fossil fuels and reducing air pollution. Um, we can save money um, from our increasing fuel costs for the schools. Um, I think it would be a great way to educate students about renewable energy and what's going to be coming in the future as we look towards shifting somewhat away from the fossil fuel economy and moving toward renewables. And I think that a, a solar and wind power system would be a great way to establish Cape Elizabeth as a, as a leading community um, in, this, in this time when we really need to be thinking about our, our energy consumption as citizens. I am seeking the approval or some type of, of resolution from the board so that I can actually go and start uh, attracting grant money to make this happen. My goal is to bring a renewable energy system at zero taxpayer cost to, to, to the school system. I think that with the <coughs> budget issues that you're currently facing from fuel cost increases already, probably hamstrings um, the, the town's budget to pay for a renewable, renewable energy system. And I believe that there's enough foundation money out there to support such a project um, in combination with, you know, with, with private donations to make this happen at zero taxpayer expense. Um, that's a big supposition. I can't guarantee that that can happen, but I believe it's possible. I've seen it done in other communities, um, and, and that, that would be my goal. Um, one in the, in the small handout that I've given you tonight, there's a, I think there's a good example on, on the second page from a school in Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, that's, that's Beverly High School. They have a 100 kilowatt system installed at their, at, <clears throat> on a piece of land that's actually next to the school, and they have a 10 kilowatt wind turbine. And um, I think that that's a good, maybe, initial goal for this project. Um, that is not going to make a huge impact on the, on the energy consumption at Cape Elizabeth High School and, and Middle School, but it would be, it would be, uh, it would be a lot more than nothing. Um, the costs for a system like they have at Beverly High School, <coughs> excuse me, it's roughly about $8 a kilowatt at, at this point in time, and that includes rebates for the, for the state of Maine. So if you, took a, if you put a 100 kilowatt system in there, that's about $800,000. Um, when Beverly did their project, it was $3 million, and that was back in the 80s. So those, those costs have come down substantially as the technology has improved and manufacturing costs have come down. Um, I think this, this would be a, um, a 
relatively slow moving project to begin with. Um, you know, getting a resolution that the schools would like this would be a very nice step where I can get, get my balls rolling a lot faster. Um, without your interest or consent, it makes it virtually impossible for my nonprofit to go out and attract grant money. I need to have um, acceptance or at least interest from the, uh, from stated interest from the school board, I think, to, uh, to initiate the project. Questions? So then with your nonprofit, what, what would be your administrative overhead for the grant dollars? That's a good question. Um, at, at this point, it would be zero because I would be the uh, I'd be the sole individual involved with the with the project. Um, I am trying to figure out where the where the right number is for that. Um, I think I can do a fair bit of aggressive grant writing on my own, um, but at some point, in, in, I would say as soon as possible, I would envision bringing on people with better expertise and more focus in the grant writing you know, world to, to assist me. So um, that's, a, that's a very good question and I don't have a firm number on that right now. Um, but I would like to have it be um, something that could sustain me say on a part-time basis to begin with. Um, what that amounts to in a dollar figure I couldn't say. I'm wondering what the right the, the process entails in terms of, um, for example, the wind, tur the wind turbine, mm -hmm. citing these. I mean, I'm guessing we need planning board approval and that type of thing before. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it's a, it's a uh, quick and easy process at, at all. Um, we do have one wind turbine on, uh, on Route 77 at right. both L's. Yeah. Um, I think it's an Im impressive that a small private business has a 10 kilowatt system in the community. I think that's a great, um, you know, great thing that that's already happened. So people have seen this beast and uh, might not be as intimidated. But um, it's not required that the turbine go up. Um, I think it's, this is a great area for it. Uh, in our coastal location, we have very good, good wind here for a turbine. So I think it would be a meaningful piece of the equation, but certainly not uh, required. Are there alternatives to wind turbines? Well, solar panels, I think, um, you know, those can be as visible or as invisible as you might like. Um, the technology today, they can lay them flat on a roof so nobody sees them. Uh, I think that would be a, a waste of a good opportunity to, pr to promote renewables. I think that's part of the beauty of this concept it is that it, it it um, is a great way to present it to the rest of our community, not only the students, but the parents and anybody else who sees the system. Um, I'd just like to share that um, the first time Phil came and spoke with Alan and myself, um, he brought um, another individual from um, a solar company who were, was able to answer some specifics about the panels. Um, and that's where we started the focus really was on those solar panels. Um, when Phil came back and spoke with the finance committee, um, there were more specifics about the fact that these solar panels could be expandable, whereas you could start off with a, a small system um, and then expand upon it on a yearly basis. Um, there was also um, a lot of kind of exciting talk about the incorporation of the school's curriculum into um, learning about renewable resources, whether um, I was picturing Dr. Efron getting very excited about the aspect of some of those uh, uh, turbines in physics class or whether it was uh, working with the solar energy in another, you know, chemistry class or whatever. Yeah, and um, Elaine, thank you, because I didn't emphasize that enough, I think, when I initially spoke that the curriculum side of it, to me, is extremely important. I mean, getting the kids involved, hands-on, um, having them participate in it, um, you can do wonderful monitoring and you know hands-on work with these systems, and I think that would be great for the students um, to not only to learn about renewables in general, but also perhaps to learn skills uh, in the renewable energy field. Uh, you know, we, there's nobody who's teaching how to do installations or design or, or anything in that in that field, so um, it seems to be wide open. 
How does the uh, kilowatt output go up as you add wind turbines? Excuse me, as you... As you if you had more than one wind turbine, how does the kilowatt output increase? Exponentially. The, each one that goes up adds, adds whatever, you know, the, the kilowatts are determined by the blade size and the wind speed. But as, as much as, you know, sometimes we tend to jump towards talking about, you know, how the, the hoops that we would have to jump through as a school board in getting approval from the town for the building of some of this, I think that, um, that the, the solar panels are something that is something that we would be able to do on our, on our own terms um, in whatever size scale that the school board would like to take a look at or maintenance would take a look at. Um, I also would think that, like Phil said, it is kind of a long-term project, and this is a, 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 a ground, <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the word I'm trying to think of. And we're starting off at ground level. But it is a chance for us to be one of the only, and maybe perhaps the first school system um, in the state of Maine to, to, to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm guessing, and I've talked with other people who kind of agree with me, in that there will be more and more school systems who will be looking towards this, and the grant money is out there, it, but it will dry up as more schools take a look at taking advantage of this. So my recommendation is that, um, it, unless we had any further questions, is that we convene perhaps um, a, a at finance committee to write some sort of a, a resolution to run by the school board as to what Phil's asking for, as to whether we would support um, Phil going forward and exploring this as an option for us. I don't think it commits us to anything um, at this point in regards to turbines, but try to get our, our foot in the door as to finding out what type of grant monies are there because, as he said, I don't think we can do this without grant money. Um, and so I, I don't know whether that fills what you're hoping to do. Sure, in, exactly. In, I, I'm not looking board. for, um, you know, a blanket approval of anything. I'm looking for a um, some, some stamp of approval interest that I could, when I write a grant, I can just say, you know, the school is, is interested to have this happen. Um, otherwise, I don't think that, that foundations are going to be willing to take the request seriously enough. That's... I think also, Phil, from the conversations we've had, that a couple of important pieces are that it is really counterproductive for Phil to start doing any work around the footprint of the building, what might be done to the buildings. Uh, until he has some idea of whether we are interested in moving ahead, at least in an exploratory manner. Uh, one of the things that we talked about, I think, in one of those first meetings was, somebody asked the question, uh, back in the Carter administration, some of you probably remember that administration, uh, that we had a uh, major fuel problem at that point in time, and there was a lot of talk about uh, renewable energy was going to be the future. And the question was, well, if it was, why isn't it now? And I think the issue then was the cost. And as Phil said earlier, the cost has gone down considerably as far as solar panels are concerned, installation of solar panels, and all of those pieces. So this, because of the energy crisis we're in, because of what we're already looking at as far as the cost of energy and what it's going to do to our budget in the next few years, uh, and I think, Phil, you gave me a timeline that we could be talking three or four years before we could be into this project completely. Grant cycles are slow moving. <coughs> so, so I think what, what Phil does need from us is some kind of approval to, for him to at least to go ahead and begin the study. Uh, I think the, the board would, would not want to give full approval of this. We, we we're going to have to see this in steps along the way. Uh, but I think it's important that we at least give Phil that go ahead because I said to Phil, I have a feeling, whether Cape Elizabeth goes with him or not, five years down the road, we're going to hear about Phil as the head of a company that is now a multi-million dollar company. And so uh, I want to be sure that if we can get on the ground floor, we should do that. Also, what is helpful is that Phil is a resident of Cape Elizabeth. So it also, he will also have a vested interest as, part, as a taxpayer here. Yes, absolutely. And, and Al, I just want to clarify that, you know, I, my ambition is not to build a multi-million dollar company. Um, it, it's truly to, to, to do this from a non-profit organization appro approach as a, as a community benefit, as something that is good for all of us. Um, 
Uh, whether or not the price of fuel continues to rise over the next three years to me is immaterial. You know, we actually live in a closed system on this planet and every you know, barrel of oil that we burn and put into the sky is ultimately you know, falling back down on us whether we breathe it or whether it's in the water that we drink. So um, uh, making money or you know, saving money is not the sole um, motivator here. It's really about doing the right thing. I'm definitely in support of exploring renewable energy for our schools. I did just want to get one thing clarified on, on the last page here, the funding strategy. Yeah. Um, so then would your organization oversee the 20% fundraising that would come from individual and corporate donations as well as the 10% from community fundraisers and special Absolutely. events? I mean, you sort of, you're kind of the whole package. Yeah. You're yeah. the... That's the objective. Okay. And my, my, um, my hope is that the, the project will attract a whole lot of interest from a lot of different people and people will say, I, you know, I'd like to help you run a, a road race or, you know, help you do whatever um, out in the community, and the kids as well. You know, if, if this could be community service work for the kids that they were interested in and wanted to be involved with, well, there'd be all kinds of uh, opportunity there, I, be I believe. But yes, that's what I'm proposing. <coughs> I don't think that I can, you know, single-handedly hold up the earth, but uh, I think I can. I mean, but I mean <laughs> you, meaning you, your organization. Yeah. That yes. you wouldn't do the, you know, part of it and then turn to the schools to raise the rest of the money. Or, no, no. Yeah. I, but I would rather that the, the people in the school, school be a community, community get, get behind it right. and say, sure. how can like we work together? Effort. Yeah. Okay. But I'm just not sure that we need the finance. Do we need the finance committee to go back and... Do you, I, I was just thinking you, someone needs to take the time um, to write an effective statement that, that represents how the board is feeling and that Phil feels that will give him the tool that he needs to go forward. But Where can we, we at to least tonight it? just say if we support it to the point where we want yes, we can. that step to Yes, happen. I would think we yeah. could. And, and I just was thinking we should probably assign who's going to write whatever needs to be written. Mm -hmm. I certainly support exploring this uh, because I agree with you. Um, we need to move forward with alternative sources. Um, I have piles of questions um, that would keep us here um, well into the evening. Um, so I don't want to uh, get into them now, but some of them relate to uh, the role of the town and the planning department in versus what falls under the school board's purview in a project of this nature, um, regardless of whether or not um, we erect turbines or we put things, uh, solar energy panels on the roof. I don't know if there's codes that speak to things like solar energy panels on roofs. Roofs. Um, so I do have a lot of questions, but my my interest is beyond mild. Um, Thank you. I'm I'm pretty keen on this, but I do think we need an opportunity to uh, for the board, not just the finance committee, to come together to um, ask a lot of these questions once we've had some time to absorb your presentation tonight. In the meantime, I would certainly express my interest, and I think it would be entirely appropriate to ask the rest of the board to express their interest at this point. So with that, um, Elaine? I would support exploring this possibility. And you've already stated your position, Trish? Yeah, absolutely. Henry? Definitely. What you have tonight is the consensus of the board that's present that you can uh, start doing some more uh, legwork on this. But I do think that we need to meet and we need to see if any concerns pop up, any questions, any issues, um, so that we're all moving in the same direction on this. I agree with that. Uh Kevin, and what, what's probably be, what would probably be helpful to everybody is that as you, as you um, compile your questions, you know, get as many as you can of them down on paper, 
and then perhaps they could be emailed to me before we had a, a, a next meeting so that I could answer as many questions as possible and then we sit down and we can have a meaningful discussion and I'm I think Alan will will uh, back me up that I'm 100% available to the extent that I can be. And I'm, I'm very close by and, and anxious to have the, the right discussions as, as quickly as possible. Well, we, I think we'll leave it up to the Finance Committee to sponsor the meeting for and make those arrangements, uh, you know, with, with an effort to uh, allow the entire board to participate. Um, so I'm going to ask Elaine at the moment to convey that on to uh, to Kathy. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Phil? Phil, thanks for all your time in putting this together. I, I think you've heard tonight that we really are uh, interested in alternatives. Um, so we'll be speaking with you soon, I suppose. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks for your time. Okay. Is there anything else, Alan, that you have for us? I don't under the superintendent's report. No. Okay. We have a school report now from the beloved Tom Eismeyer of Pond Cove, and some of us are going to have to move out of the way. I think so. I, I, I organized it around uh, some PowerPoint slides to have some talking points. So. Do you need those lights on? Tom? I just wanted to uh, to bring you up to date where we are with uh, the teacher leadership position, particularly since it's not filled currently and we're in transition. So these are um, my thoughts about uh, teacher leadership in general. Um, they reflect some of the conversations I've had with Alan and the plans we have for refocusing and hopefully filling the position in the very near future. Um, some of my remarks will be directly my values because we did, uh, in my point of view, because we did restructure, I think that's the term, when we went from a more traditional assistant principal model, assistant principal model to a teacher leader position. Um, what we had originally decided, I mean, leadership is defined in many different ways, but the, the point at Pond Cove was instructional leadership. And one of the functions we were talking about was to have a shared vision of uh, quality instruction and results for kids at Pond Cove. In order to do that in any school, we would have to build norms or you know, values around teachers working together and collaborating, not just for their personal work, but around uh, student work and curriculum. At the same time, instructional leadership in this view supports the teacher's knowledge growth and pedagogical growth. And this one I intentionally put up because I think it's uh, come up as a theme. Um, we've seen it before with curriculum evaluation and with the way we go about for staff supervision evaluation. The formative part of the leadership being um, here's how to help you do the things we like to do at Pond Cove. And the second part, the summative part is that's the way we do things at Pond Cove. When we hire people now at Pond Cove, we don't ask them to bring bags of tricks when they say, I did this where I was working before. We say that that's very nice, but we do everyday math in a certain way. We do guided reading a certain way. So we're very focused instructionally and we give people support to be able to do that and to give us feedback on how we're doing. The challenge, of course, no one person can do this. It's just, it's just impossible and to pretend otherwise would uh, just be a sham. So. What, we, what we're trying to do is, is moving, behind, moving beyond the model of equating leadership just with one person. It has to be a group effort, a community effort. 
and part of the challenge is to, for us to influence each other about what we do. So there's a quotation you're free to read. So leadership in this view is, uh, is not specifically reside in principals or in teachers, but it resides among all of us. The current term for it is distributed leadership or leadership density. I have to admit it's, it's, it's been a big change. It's been a, it's been a change from the office point of view and it's been a, a change from the teacher's perceptions. When Kelly first admirably filled the job, no matter how much upfront advertising we did and talking to people, people were still looking for the assistant principal. It, it was, uh, it's still out there, it's getting better, and maybe some people miss the assistant principal, because this way of reorganizing the school was a little different. It's, uh, you know, traditionally, from the, particularly the business point of view, there's a manager on top of the pyramid, controlling quality all the way down. It just doesn't work that way uh, in any school, because the uh, deliverers of instruction are right in the classroom. Unless we have a more flattened structure, it's not going to work. I, I include this slide whenever presentation I think makes sense because I really like it, but that's really what happens um, I think in the school. We, we go along certain ways and it's always around budget time. I think we're asked to look at the wallpaper one more time. Do we have to do the way, do it the way we're doing it? Can you please take a hard look at this and maybe try another different? It's, I'm sorry it takes the budget crunch to do it, but sometimes that's the way it goes. So we did. I'll give you, for newer board members, we're thinking about where we wanted to go. It was Tom Frisella who brought in the, uh, the very effective and elaborate uh, change process we called Future Directions Planning that involved the, the whole community. And as we rolled it out, um, we started, we got out to the schools and the teachers. We started thinking about how are we going to make this Future Direction Plan work? What's going on at Pond Cove that would uh, make it work not just for the district, but at Pond Cove and for each teacher and for each child, for all the families at Pond Cove. Uh, a key part of this we discovered in order for us to uh, meet our mission and vision goals was around professional development. And one of the action teams recommended that there be a school-based staff developer at Pond Cove the middle school and the high school. Now I'm getting back to the budget part. In addition to Sarah, of course, uh, the teachers wisely determined that in order to meet these goals for differentiation, assessment, for staying up on standard-based curriculum, they're going to have to work, people, work with people with more content knowledge and make connections. Um, you know and I know that it simply can't happen with the budget. We can't afford to do all these things. So it was a nice idea. We seemed a little stuck. That's where the idea for tapping teacher leadership came in. This. So we, we thought about what, what would it would be like if we could have a person on staff, getting back to that instructional focus again, what, what would this person look, what are the skills, what are the basic qualifications we would need, what are we looking for? It's in red and underlined. I think this system depends on having an internal person, somebody who is a, a proven practitioner, is known and trusted and recognized. So we made it clear in the beginning that it should be somebody already at Pond Cove. This person should be not only a teacher of kids, but should already have demonstrated some skills or interest in teaching teachers. And also be able to sit down and push people a little more with the term as reflective inquiry, not to, just to be a, a, a mechanical practitioner, but to think long and hard about what we're doing. Oh, I should say, feel free to interrupt me, but I don't want to keep you up too late. Responsibilities uh, going along the same line would be to work directly with teachers in the classrooms. That's the most important place to do it because you know from my point of view, as much as I want to say that I supervise and evaluate and I do, I cannot be in classrooms as uh, often uh, and, as long as, and, and I, as long as I'd like to. And it's a much different relationship when it's a non-administrative, non-evaluative person coming in. Um, the skill, work with groups of teachers, be good with working with grown-ups and connect with, uh, again, a focus with the district about where we were going. If we, if we had a theme about reading or writing, then that was a district goal, and this person would help with the K through 12 goals, too. So uh, front-loading it with these almost impossible demands, um, we decided to, um, we looked around, and we had candidates, we interviewed candidates, and fortunately, we got Kelly Hassan, who you know, stepped up and did a wonderful job. However, we weren't really quite sure what to expect in the first year. We wrote a very elaborate 
job description. It, I think you've seen it. We knew in the beginning that we were throwing out a wide net just to make sure we kind of covered our bases and included some things that the teacher leader, that's what we were calling position, should not do. Don't deal directly with the discipline, do not evaluate and so on. But there must have been, what, Alan, 20 things on there, you've seen it. But we did it on purpose knowing we'd, we'd have to focus to be able to do that. For us, it was a starting point. This was uh, new territory. Kelly was a pioneer, like other teacher leaders around the state and around the country. It's new and different, not just for the principal and the teacher leader, but for the rest of the school, and quite frankly, the parents who would call up and ask for the assistant principal, too. What we found along the way, when we began to get focused, was it was around instruction and definitely around curriculum when we began to hit our stride. We discovered, too, that different skills and different arrangements were called for, it could be by subject area. When, if, for example, we had been a middle school trying this and the Milty project started, we probably would have looked for someone, if Gary Lenoir were still a teacher, and, and encouraged Gary to apply uh, to be a teacher leader. That would be a lot different, say, from someone helping us with the math curriculum. So we began to discover, to discover that the leadership would have to be focused to the job at hand but we're doing this on the fly. And again, just to follow up on that, a lot of the, lead, the instructional leadership varies by subject area uh, for teachers and for leaders. It's just like flipping channels on TV. Now we have to go back. For example, um, the, the fourth grade was um, had, was trying to develop a unit to meet one of the, uh, the standards for the learning results, and it was around physics. Fourth grade teachers openly said, we don't know a lot about physics. So their study group a couple of years ago involved having a, a high school physics teacher come in and help them with the content knowledge of that. And, and that, that uh, unit is now part of the curriculum. Um, this is a primary um, language arts, a much different uh, knowledge base than uh, physics for this. So what we found here was we were able to focus the content around that, uh, our favorite authors found us in alphonics and the way we like to teach uh, guided reading, which again be became a focus for grades K, 1, and 2. Um, I think that it really took off when we discovered a broader theme that we, we had excellent teachers of writing individually, but we, we found common curriculum with the Lucy Calkins things in, uh, for grades K through two. And then, you know, but this flywheel theory, then the teacher leadership really took off. There was a lot of common interest. We had common curriculum to talk about. People really got enthusiastic. We didn't drop the other projects, but this really got it going. At the same time, <coughs> Another example of uh, internal teacher leadership, there wasn't um, a series of material as uh, detailed and as attractive for grades three and four and up as a Lucy Calkins thing. So the, the grades three and four teachers had been, I referred to where we were with professional development, investigating different authors uh, on their own. And they proposed that they build their curriculum around this book and a couple of others that, that they, they had found in their own readings and investigations. And part of it, by the way, had been part of a supervision evaluation plan. So for grades three and four, talking about leadership, they came up with this plan and, and spent summer with Kelly's assistants getting, getting this together. We also discovered, you know, besides knowing what the content is, that people needed craft knowledge. We did some of this from lesson study. How do you actually teach these things? So you, and you, you can see from these pictures that you don't do it just alone at Ponco. People can come in and uh, in this, the forward slide, those are teachers talking about what they actually observed in that day in terms of teacher learning, of student learning, I mean. I mentioned Kelly as, as a pioneer, but it's nice to know that, that pioneers have company. We're, we're not the only district trying this. There, there are different terms for this type of leadership in Maine and nationally. At Coach, I'll just run down through. You've probably heard all these. There's one that's very particular to this. The teacher scholar, I think, is a local one. I think I've only heard that one in southern Maine, but it's another model. And actually, Alan is familiar with that. So the, they're out there, and um, Kelly's one of them. 
We also found when we were looking at ways to describe this model that the school-based staff developer is a good way of describing it. It is a, a teacher helping a teacher get getting better at teaching kids. And the other model is um, a personal trainer, people uh, coaching individual teachers. The team coach model is to do things like study groups, the kind of work that brought the third and fourth grade writing approach to the surface. Organizing teacher networks, not just in the school, but maybe in a region with other schools. Encourage teacher to teacher mentoring. And at Pond Cove, um, work with grade levels. Lesson study has faded somewhat. I think it made the fatal error of calling it Japanese lesson study years ago. I'll never do that again. I think we're doing it in different ways now. We're just not calling it lesson study, having uh, people observe lessons and watch kids' reactions. And helping conduct workshops for the whole staff. The personal trainer dimension of it is to plan directly with an individual teacher uh, at request through demonstration or model lessons. Well, you can read all these. Go teach. Just a slightly different way of approaching it's individual. Uh, my value is my assumptions, what I've learned about this, and I think it's been extremely successful, is that this offer or this potential is for all teachers, not just selected teachers, and I'll, I'll tell you something encouraging about that in a minute or so. It's very important to consider the function of, of, the, of the leadership, not just say, here's your position, you're a leader. Uh, so we have more work to do to describe the function. The, the position was originally intended to be classroom-based, and I think that's the way to go. I think that's the, the cycle of a classroom teacher uh, becoming, assuming that leadership position outside the classroom, then returning to the classroom is an excellent model, and avoiding the administrative-based responsibilities. And t we focused on the beginning, and it'll be clearer the second time around, focus on teaching and learning, not the organizational issues like scheduling and buses and other things like that. We were pretty clean about it the first time, and we should um, continue that way. Come on. I didn't pay my cable bill. I think people can grow into the position. Um, some people at Pond Cove were, were shy about it. I, I don't consider myself capable of doing this. I don't consider myself uh, a leader. I think that's changing somewhat now that Kelly's done it, that there are skills that you can learn with the support of the district to show more leadership. You don't, it's not just your personal trait. Um, this has been re-emphasized, the kind of work we're doing at Pond Cove work embedded, classroom based, live, real stuff with results to be seen almost right away rather than the old model that we're getting away from of having a staff development meeting in August, another one in November and one in May. And this is very important to be able to think about what works for Pond Cove in certain classrooms under certain, circum certain, certain circumstances rather than just say let's implement a basal and see how we do with that. Just to let you know that the connections we're making, I mentioned supervision and evaluation um, more than once, that when Alan did his presentation, it just, he mentioned that we have a two-track system that um, tenured teachers have the option to do something that, you know, that I, I think allows them to exercise leadership potential. In fact, we, one of the projects that Rand Wilkinson did around a spelling assessment as part of his evaluation a couple of years ago is now part of our assessment strategies. People are just taking it for granted. It was Rand's assessment. We're doing it. And he, he's tracked data over two or three years now. And uh, we always have, and Alan is really supporting it publicly now, uh, about having a community of learners in each building and around the district. One of two definitions, well, two quotations around what it means um, for instructional leadership is that we all teach each, we teach each other. And that second quotation, it turns out, at least at the elementary level, about teaching material seems to me to be very critical. The more concrete we are about what we're doing and have things to talk about, the better, better we off we are. They're amazing when they have things to do, how, they, how the teachers uh, are sensitive to kids' needs and uh, schedule things and get the curriculum organized. 
we, this is the first year we've been part of the Casco Bay Education Alliance, and it turns out that community of learners and teacher leadership is a big theme at CBEA. And in fact, we're off to a meeting tomorrow night again, which uh, the Dunning and Discuss does that. So it's really been fitting well. The second part, and you're very familiar with the success of Project Blueprint, teacher leadership is a theme of Project Blueprints now, and I think we have a lot to offer and a lot to learn from them. What's next? Well, we, we were not able to fill the position beginning of the year, but uh, Alan managed to get Marla Bono on board. Alan, by the way, really supported the position publicly and got us through what could have been a tough time by being so public in his advocacy for the position. We, we had Marla, you remember what a great job Marla did as assistant principal. Marla came in and not only took over some of the tasks, but re was able to get around to, to teachers individually and, and groups to get feedback on the position, um, maybe put away some of the, I think, misconceptions that were out there. She just did a wonderful job that way. So in the past couple of months, we have been able to talk about the position at faculty meetings and knowing that not everybody is ready or in their, in their careers uh, to think about this. We've had subgroup meetings and we had, what, 10 or 15 people, Alan, at that meeting? We had a follow-up meeting about people who might be interested in uh, assuming a designated leadership position other than principal or assistant principal at Pond Cove, and about 15 people came. I was thrilled to say that. Come on, you. Uh, out of that came, and this is coming up in a week and a half, each team is going to have a representative come to an all-day meeting with uh, Sarah Simmons and I are going to facilitate it, using, by the way, a lot of the work from Project Blueprint to see if we can get to the bottom of this, to see where we want to go, with, target it, look at it, come up with a job description, we hope, talk about short-term strategies, long-term strategies, because we're not sure what to do for the rest of the year. That's coming up in a week and a half, and uh, Alan will be there too, so we'll definitely report back on that. Uh, looking ahead, as I said, I, I'm just gratified to hear people say, I, I, I can't do it next year or the year after that, but down the road, I'd really be able to do that. What can I do in the meantime? What can I do in the classroom? That, to me, is showing that we're building capacity. I think with our connections to CBEA and Project Blueprint and other people doing this, it'll, it will inspire people to step up and make it part of it. And you haven't asked about this, you've been very kind. We, we still need hard data about how this will work. We've done it for a couple of years now. I've been reporting it back. We see it, we know it's working, but I still, I think I owe you some data about how this is going. Next steps, keep going in a week to see where we are, focus it. Recommendations will come out of that meeting through Alan, I think, um, and make sure that the, the uh, people interested are taking advantage of the opportunities that come out, uh, come up even this year. Uh, people who are interested will need support, and then we'll have to plan for a transition to, uh, whenever it happens, either this year or next. And that is the presentation. I hope it wasn't too long. Ann. I, I think it'll be more or less the same, but, but more focused. I think we, we, we removed some things intentionally from the job description. What we didn't have when we started was a clear goal, a clear focus when we started. And, and Alan has pointed out that's really critical to do for the, for the next time. Whether it's working on reading instruction or doing something around RTI, which is the next big thing. I think that will really help do it. As far as the strategies go, I think they'll remain the same. Yes. <laughs> we, I, I think what we're looking at, to be honest with you, is, is seeing what we might be able to do this spring yeah. with somebody doing perhaps a half time as a staff member. And I've had a couple of staff members who expressed some interest in that. Uh, what, I, what I would comment on is the fact that what Tom has done for me and for, I think, for the school board is, and for the staff is to really review where it started, where it's been, and where it needs to go. And next, uh, was it a week from Friday the 18th, yeah. when we do the uh, full day workshop with a group of teachers, uh, what is happening is teachers are playing a critical role 
in looking at where do we go next and how do we do this. And so I think it's going to be uh, a next step that is going to make for success as we, as we move this ahead. Uh, I firmly believe, and, and you'll always hear me talk about building capacity, and building capacity means you take a look at where you are now, you take a look at where you want to go, and you help people build the capacity to get, the, to get to that point. And I feel very strongly that what Tom and I have talked about with the staff, and Marla has helped us as she's been there, is we've talked about shifting the view to let's build capacity to where we want to go and what we want this to look like. And so the 18th will be a key piece in this capacity building. Uh, I'm, I'm not willing, and I think I told the board up front, I'm not willing to rush just to fill a position. I want to be absolutely sure we understand where we want it to go and what it's going to do. And I think we're on a very good track to do that. Yeah. Uh, like Tom said, I was thrilled with the meeting we had just recently where we had, I think, I think you're right, I think it's 13 or 14 people there who are all very interested in helping guide this process and represent the other members of the staff. It, 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 the first time when we put it out there, I, I, we just, I wasn't getting to everybody. And it, it, it's taken a couple of years for people to see what this really means. No matter how many times you say it, you really have to see it and interact for it to, to be meaningful. There are still some people who really think, well, what's the difference, teacher, leader, assistant, principal? <laughs> so we're, we're still working on it. But I think the, the mental progress has been immense in the, in the past few months. Anything else for Tom? Thank you. We now have uh, committee reports. The first is a finance finance committee, and since neither Kathy or Rebecca are here, Elaine will give us an abbreviated version. Um, yes, the finance committee met on October 25th. Um, there was. Uh, Two things that will be coming up for a vote later on in the evening that were discussed at this meeting. Uh, we also went over energy report with Pauline and um, I think that pretty much explains itself when we get to the votes later on in the evening. Those were the main two things we talked about. Would you like me to move into the planning committee? Yes, please, Mike. <laughs> um, the planning committee met on October 17th. Uh, we are still discussing uh, future directions and how it ties in with the current long-term planning. Uh, currently, Alan and his administrators are developing some student learning and staff development goals. And they vary from uh, continued work on the K through 12 uh, curriculum to some of our custodial maintain maintenance issues at the schools. We will continue to review future directions. Uh, Alan will be meeting with the various teams that were part of future directions. We are looking to do a possible December or January workshop in which uh, the school board would be updated on the status of future directions. And also, we'd like to do that at that time because of the budget implications on some of those action plans. Um, We'll continue to work in, on the charge and the goal and how we're going to tie those two committees together um, as time goes along. Terrific. And policy? The policy committee met on October 19th. The first item was our technology policies. Um, Gary Lenoy was present and he presented a packet of sample policies for technology. We have, we currently have technology policies, but um, MSMA has come out with a number of new revised um, policies around technology because there's been so many changes, of course, in this area. And he presented those. Um, we discussed them somewhat. He's going to be revising those and presenting those to the committee again next week when we meet for our November meeting. And um, then we'll be bringing those forward for probably for our first reading in December. 
Um, we next discussed the D policies, which are the fiscal policies. Paulina Portria came and reviewed all of our D policies, and we'll be presenting those earlier tonight for a first reading, with a few exceptions. Um, and I'll just read the ones that we're going to be reviewing in more detail. Policy DBAA, authorization to commit district funds for special ed, we're going to be looking into in more detail. DFR, fundraising administrative procedures. DFAB, athletic booster organizations. And DFD, um, gate receipts and admissions. We then um, looked at the homework policy, which um, we will be discussing later this evening and um, that was that was it thank you um, Trish substance abuse um, the committee met on October 25th we continued our discussion on the student self-referral and the committee um, supports maintaining this aspect of the policy um, we began a discussion of the system of consequences which are invoked when the policy is violated. Several options were considered and we'll continue this discussion at the next meeting and come up with a recommendation. Um, the next meeting is Tuesday, November 15th at 8 a.m. Personnel Committee, Elaine. Thank uh, yes. you, Trish. Yep, the Personnel Committee uh, met on October 24th uh, in which they reviewed the superintendent's evaluation tool which we discussed uh, during executive session prior to this evening's meeting. Uh, we are starting work on the staff evaluation tools. And on November 28th, which is our next meeting, we will be uh, looking at the evaluation tool for administrators. And on December 19th, we will be hearing from the evaluators on the evaluations for uh, staff support such as bus drivers, uh, food service, custodials, and coaches. Um, we're looking to do these uh, teacher evaluations with a review committee um, for the teachers in the springtime. Uh, currently, we're also taking a look at the uh, Drummond and Woodson copies uh, of policies uh, so that we could make any recommendations um, to the policy committee on any changes that we might like to see or additional policies added to our book. Uh, our negotiations are uh, ongoing with the administrators and they are getting ready to get started with the teachers. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, the next is communications committee. Rebecca is not here. Trish, is there anything you can no, report? No, no, no work. Okay, thank you. Um, the next is Elaine again on the Athletic Committee. Um, there isn't much to report. We've been trying to meet uh, as a steering committee, and as you know, uh, at our last meeting, we had a motion and an approval to have a new standing committee that is a, I'm going to get the name of it wrong, but we'll get it together. It is going to encompass both athletics and extracurriculars for our students in the school system. And we hopefully will meet um, before the new year to go over the charge of this committee and some of the goals for, the, for next year. But that will get going. And the, one of the first things on the agenda will be sports done right. Terrific. I'd like to remind everyone that the minutes of committee meetings are posted on the website and are available there. Um, we're going to move on to reports from non-board committees. Uh, non-board committees, the first is legislative liaison. Uh, which is Rebecca, who is not here. I do know she met recently with Connie Goldman around funding issues, and that there is another meeting be ar being arranged um, with Connie and the uh, Jim Ryan of the Department of Education. Will you be attending that as well? Adam? I probably will. I haven't I, had the day yet. I think that would be good. Um, Next is the uh, Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, Elaine. Um, yes, um, I just want to report that their capital campaign is ongoing. Uh, they publicly announced that they had hit the $500,000 mark um, with a, a percentage going to endowment, um, another percentage going to large impact grants such as our Achievement Center, uh, teacher grants, and professional development. Uh, currently, they are in their professional development grant cycle, and they recently received 11 grant requests uh, for a total of about $57,000. Um, 
Two of them were deferred for uh, the teacher grant cycle later in the spring. Uh, two are on hold for policy decisions from their board. And their budget for these grants was approximately $15,000. So they've sat down and they uh, made some recommendations that will be coming before their SEATH board. But I'll tell you, I, I got a chance to look at some of the grant proposals from our staff for professional development. And they're very impressive. And they are things that um, will re return to our school system tenfold with what they'll bring back. And they range from individual conferences to um, particular opportunities for writing projects for 40 teachers to attend, where they would come to our schools and work with um, the teachers on, on um, uh, writing projects and reading strategies and um, that type of stuff. So it's really very, very good stuff. Um, and it's a tough job, as you know, to uh, take 11 requests worth almost $60,000 and and say, no, you can't do it this year. And please come back next year. So um, I thank them for taking the time to make that happen for us. Thank you, Elaine. My turn. Portland Arts and Technical High School. Um, I am again serving as uh, chair of the General Advisory Committee of Portland Austin Technical High School. I think this is the seventh or eighth year. And I am also serving on their budget committee. And one of the primary roles of the advisory committee is to approve the budget. Um, the uh, administration and teacher of the school have brought forward a, uh, a budget which is called a Part two, uh, yes, part two budget of $143,951. What part two means is we are committed as a, as a sending school to pay for our portion of new and replacement equipment necessary to run the programs. Um, there was teachers, it just a, an administration, just as our process is, put together that, um, that listing, which I believe should have been provided to everyone on the board, and if it hasn't, it will be. Um, listing by cluster what the new equipment is. And that is the 143951 Our share of Pass expenses is 2.4%. So our share of the uh, new equipment budget is, uh, for rounding purposes, $3,500. Um, that um, $143,000 budget represents a zero increase over the prior year. The prior year was a zero increase over the the year before, and the year before it came in under, um, the budget came in under what it had been in the past by some percentage points. Um, it has been our direction to the administration there to, that they will have to maintain a 0% rate of increase on new, new and replacement equipment. So I will be recommending to the full board that we had we approve that amount for the part two uh, assessment. The other part of our assessment is effectively tuition. And that is our share of the total operating costs for PASS. And the way that is calculated is we take the average students attending that are reported to the Department of Education in the prior two years. So for the year, for in October 03, we had um, 10 students attending. In October 04, we had 16 students attending uh, with an average of 13 students. And that works out to our, our load of the total student population is 2.4%. So the tuition is uh, the tuition, what I call the tuition piece is $60,036.69 or $60,000 for rounding purposes. I would again um, recommend that to the uh, 
the full board. That number represents a continuing good investment of dollars for the students that are involved in these programs. We have no way of providing those opportunities for students here. Um, PASS is about the only opportunity, although um, there are some other uh, schools similar to PASS uh, that are available to us. So uh, I will be re recommending both of those uh, under, under new business, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them now. Seeing none, we can move on. We have board advisory committees, Town's Comprehensive Plan Committee, and that's Elaine Maloney. Uh, yes, they met on October 27th. Um, they finalized their telephone survey, and that uh, should have started at this point. Um, they have had a meeting with the state planning office and um, sat through a presentation with them on land use and planning goals. We are still uh, planning for the December 8th forum that will be held here in council chambers, um, where we'll be um, looking for feedback from the community on the comprehensive plan and the survey and some of their thoughts on the development of the town. We are also putting together a, a vision statement that will also be up for discussion at that forum. Thanks, Elaine. Unfinished business. The first item is information on insurance regarding the Costa Rica trip. Alan, I think, are you going to handle that? You have a, you have a set of documents in your packet. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of them in Spanish, so I don't know how many of you could read them well. But you have a cover letter from Mark Pendavid, Tim Pendaris, where he talks about the fact that he has checked a company that are using his travel aids of Argentina. Uh, he has sent along the insurance coverage information to us. And Pauline has checked with our insurers about this. Same story as I've told you before. Uh, <coughs> number one, you will have to vote to accept this trip. Uh, number two is that our liability insurance will cover Mark and the adults who are the chaperones on this trip. Uh, Mark will has and will put together uh, the insurance uh, information for s individual students that is covered by the insurance policy. Uh, if you noted in the cover letter, he has been in contact with the U.S. Embassy in Costa Rica uh, to begin the process of procuring visas, uh, and it looks like all systems are set in, in Costa Rica. Uh, and he will be having a preliminary talk with students to look for host families pending your final approval. But from the question of final approval, uh, from what we were able to uh, get as he translated some of this information for us is, uh, our insurer said that we, it is basically the same type of insurance that it does cover the company, it does cover the students. Uh, the students will have forms that they must complete around health insurance coverage and be sure their health insurance coverage covers in Costa Rica uh, and that your uh, liability policy will cover uh, Mark and the uh, people who are with him. And Jeff, I know that you came, you had talked to Mark, you're his representative tonight. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add at this point to that. Um, not particularly if the board has any questions or reminders about logistics or dates or numbers of kids and that sort of stuff. I've gone over that with Mark. I think I can answer those questions. But, uh, insurance information is for I think the only open issue was the insurance issue. Is that right? Yes. And I had one other insurance question. Oh, sure. Um, we, we talked about, does this include trip cancellation insurance? Because that was another situation that's popped up before. So that's encompassed in that plan. OK. Thank you. Terrific. I think the only thing that I would add to that for all of our foreign trips is my understanding now is that each of these companies is well aware of alerts if there are terrorist alerts in different countries our countries are put on alert. For instance, I would question if we were planning to go to Paris tomorrow, whether that trip would happen because of what's happening there at this point. And so there's also coverage for that and, and in that instance. And again, I turn back to Sue because she certainly dealt with that this summer uh, in England with the terrorist attack that was there and our students over there at that point in time. But that's my understanding is the Depart State Department is uh, careful watch and keep 
the travel agencies informed about what's going on. Next item is confirmation of an appointment that I made uh, about a month ago. This item should have been removed from the agenda. Um, starting to sound like Duke Albanese. Um, from the agenda, and um, it was simply a miscommunication. But since it's on the agenda, I will explain that we have adopted new policy which, in which the, uh, the chairperson appoints individuals as commi to committees, and then that, uh, those appointments need to be affirmed by the entire board. Well, it's next month, um, everyone will be vacating their current positions, uh, mo at least momentarily, pending appointments by the new chairperson, and then we will go through whatever process is necessary. So this is uh, sort of an unnecessary, untimely um, item, and I not only want to table it, I would like to vacate it from, the, uh, from consideration. I would like to make a motion that we vacate it vacate it and, and, and fill the whole slate of new uh, committee appointments after the election and swearing in of new members. Terrific. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Henry, any further conversation? All those in favor? 5-0. Next item is consideration of the superintendent's recommendations for athletic fee positions for winter 2005. Actually, Kevin, I think that there's another item that we added under unfinished business is the curriculum development and adoption. I'll see I see it. You're right. I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought that was the next. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so. The next item is C, under unfinished business, which is policy IGA curriculum development and adoption. And I think we'll, Anne will explain what's happening with that. This is just, it's a second reading on this policy. It's policy IGA curriculum development and adoption. That was just an oversight. It should have, we should have had a second reading on it last month at our meeting. Um, so I think you all have a, a copy of it now. It was on your, in the packet. On your, seats here when you came in. Um, and there are really no um, changes from the first reading. We had, it, had, it was asked that the, that the policy committee take it back and have some discussion around some of the items on it. So we did do that and brought it back uh, in the same way for the second reading. So I'd like to make a motion to approve policy IGA, curriculum development and adoption as presented here. Second. Elaine, thank you. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, all in favor? 5-0, policy is adopted. And I just want to point out that um, we did put in here, uh, it, was, it was in the first reading too, I just want to remind people that um, item F is that the school board shall approve a course of studies in each of January for the following year pending budget approval. So we'll have to be sure to address that in some way. And I think we need to be careful. Um, something that's not happened in the past, Alan, is for us to comb through our policies um, and make a make a listing of all of those events that have to happen at certain times of the year. Because um, we have, we have uh, through no one's fault, missed some of those things. Um, and we do need to get on track with that. So with your help, and I guess actually Mary's help, um, <laughs> that will happen. Thank you, Ann. Um, now we're on to new business and consideration of the superintendent's recommendation for athletic fee positions for winter 2005. 
I have three this evening. The first one is for Muzzy Barton. Uh, as a middle school Nordic ski coach, there's a note on here that says he has been a part of the Nordic program for many years, his great knowledge of the sports. And this recommendation comes from Scott Labby, middle school athletic director. Motion, please. So moved. Thank you, Elaine. Second. Second. Thank you, Ann. Conversation. All in favor? 5 0. Second one I have is from Maddie Reed to be the seventh grade boys basketball coach. Uh, it notes that Maddie is a former Cape player, he has great knowledge of the game. The people uh, recommending him are Scott Labby, the middle school athletic director, and Jim Ray, the high school basketball coach. Motion, please. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for Maddie Reed for basketball coach. Second. Elaine, well, any conversation? I just had one question on, uh, notice on the forms that it, it's not specific to him, I guess. I don't know whether I should ask this question now that it says the number of candidates interviewed was only one in both of those instances. I'm guessing that's because those were the only applicants for the job. I'm assuming that's true. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. No other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? 5-0. And the third one is from Keith Weatherby, and this is for Eric Worsing to be the assistant hockey coach at 140.4 hours and a level three. Eric has had many years of coaching experience. He was the head ice hockey coach at York High School for a number of years. <coughs> I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation to hire Eric Worsing as assistant hockey coach. Second. Elaine, thank you. Conversation. All in favor? 5-0. And that's all the athletic fee positions that I have. Okay. The next item is co-curricular fee positions. Uh, the first one I have is from uh, this is middle school, Tammy Thatcher, SAT member replacing Carly Bean. And the SAT is their student assistance team. Uh, do you want me to go through the whole I, list? I, I think you should, and okay. perhaps we can take a consolidated vote on it. At the high school is Matt Clemens for speech and debate. For uh, Betsy Nilsson, for Aunt NIAS steering committee chair. Uh, Jeff, I'm assuming that these NIAS ones are ones they have been serving in that position as we went through the NIASC process. Uh, Roger Rio, NIASC Steering Committee, Hannah Jones, the same, Katie Lisa, the same, and Ted Jordan, the same. Also have Ralph Norris, Jazz Combos 1 and 2, Todd Roberts, Jazz Band 2, Deb Riccio, uh, Theater Assistant, Peter Bloom, Tech Design for Drama. Uh, System-wide mentors for teachers as required by certification. Remember, you approved quite a few of these, I think, last month. This is another one, Julie Salis, uh, Salikas, for Gina Razi. Can I have a motion, please? Go ahead, Elaine. Yeah, I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations for the co-curricular fee uh, individuals as cited. Second. Thank you, Trish. Conversation? <coughs> All those in favor? Opposed? 5-0. We have already done the consideration of a proposed trip by members of the swim team. Well, did we vote no, on this? We the, didn't vote. We have to do the cross country one. Oh, I'm sorry. The swim team yes. we voted on. Yes. Have you voted on it? Are you, you yes. sorry, but yes. you did vote on it. Okay. Yep. Next is consideration of requests from the athletic department to allow boys and girls high school cross country teams to travel to Vermont to participate in the regionals. Alan, is you, do you have anything on that? Yes, as you heard Trish say, we congratulated both the girls and boys cross country team from the high school who won the states. Now they're on to the regionals. Uh, you have in your packet a form from Keith Weatherby. Uh, the coach making the request is David Weatherby and Mary Ann Doss. Uh, the dates of the proposed trip are November 11th and 12th of 2005. It does not interfere with any school days. 
Uh, so in other words, mm. it's this Friday and Saturday. Uh, destination is, is at Thetford Academy in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, purpose of the, is the New England Cross Country Championships. Transportation will be three vans, 16 runners plus three drivers, and the destination is Vermont. Cost is $30 per runner for meals. Uh, possible fundraising activities, rooms paid by athletic budget, transportation by boosters, and entry fee paid by the athletic budget. Supervision, uh, there will be three chaperones, two coaches and one parent. Uh, do all the athletes have equal opportunity? We, allowed, we are allowed to run seven in each race. And explain the cost of the trip. This is the first year that the Maine Principals Association has chosen teams to represent Maine in the New Englands. Our girls and boys both won their respective classes in the state meet and therefore represent Maine along with five other schools in the New England competition. So quite an honor for our boys and girls cross country. Okay. And Keith did apologize for the lateness of this request, but they just found out they won. Yeah. <laughs> well, that happens in sports seasons. Right. Um, a motion, please. I move Rich? that we approve the um, request or the, for the girls and boys cross country team to participate in the regionals in Vermont. Second. Elaine, conversation. Just a question. Um, if it's paid for in the athletic budget, is that because there were savings in the budget elsewhere? I'm guessing we don't budget for regional. Regionals. I have to look to Jeff. I, I, do you have any idea at all? Um, I, I don't. I believe they do have some money in the budget to take care of any post season competition that they might be eligible for. Right. That, that's my recollection too, but without the athletic budget in front of me, I wouldn't want to that makes sense. Okay. stamp that as... Uh, that suffices. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? 5-0. Consideration of proposal to authorize the Finance Committee to sign school warrants. You know what, I guess I'll take this one. I move that we authorize the member of the Finance Committee to sign any and all warrants of the school district on behalf of the entire school board until that this is rescinded. Thank you, Henry. Questions? All in favor? Five zero. The next item, this was discussed at the Finance Committee meeting, um, and that is their proposal um, to decrease the temperature in the schools from 70 degrees to 69 degrees as it, that's daytime as an initial effort to um, address the uh, dramatic increase in heating costs for which there is no room in the budget. I will make a motion that we uh, adopt <clears throat> the Finance Committee proposal and ask for a second. Thank you, Henry. Conversation. If I may just comment a, mo a moment on that. What, has, what is happening because of the final uh, rebuilding, reconstruction of the high school, we now have a computer system that should control all three buildings. We're in the process right now of getting the high school balanced so that the, that control works so that we don't have some rooms that are 75 and some that are 65. But that balancing has been occurring and I think is pretty close to finished. So what will be possible now is that Ernie can therefore uh, manage the heat throughout all three of those buildings. It does not include Town Hall, but it does include our three schools. And so what, we would, what is proposed is to drop it by one degree at this point in time to see, number one, the effects on the schools, and number two, uh, to see the effects on savings. Uh, recognizing the fact that one degree is not a very large uh, drop, 
but we want to see how that plays out with the balancing. We may come back to you later on uh, with other suggestions. Thank you, Alan. Any questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? Five zero. Next item is consideration of Cape's portion of the past budget for FY 2006-07, part two, but it should also include part one because we have that new information available. So I will move that we adopt our portion of the Portland Arts and Technical High School Part 1 and Part 2 course as follows. For Part 1, $60,000 in round numbers, and for Part 2, um, $3,500 in round numbers. And that we authorize Kevin Sweeney to report the results of this to pass on November 17th. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor? Five zero. Alan, would you also convey this information to finance? I think that oh, consideration of a bus lease. Alan, do you know what the amount of the bus lease is? Yes, the amount of the bus lease is $70,080. Uh, what this is is to uh, seek approval to go to Bank North Leasing Corporation in the name of the town of Cape Elizabeth to obtain uh, this uh, lease amount of money uh, so that we can move ahead with the purchase of the bus. There is um, a lot of verbiage on this. This is a public document. I am going to move that we um, approve um, the language of this document so that uh, we might lease a bus at a, at a cost of $70,080. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ann. Conversations, questions? Has this do away with another bus or is this an additional bus? Sue? So, Okay. Will that bus be scrapped or sold? Um, we usually put them out to bid, and they are sold. Terrific. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? 5 0. I was just curious as to who would buy those buses. I think an old hippie. I was going to say, I think sometimes they're private purchasers who use them for recreation. Really? Uh, I don't know. And I, I probably there are places, perhaps more private schools, who will buy the older buses, but are they more recreation use? And sometimes, yes. Um, they are bought by private schools or by other districts. Um, yes, they are bought by private schools or by other districts that maybe, you know, just some spare buses. But some recreation. During my travels through the northern part of Maine, I would often happen upon school buses in the middle of nowhere and kind of scratch my head and wonder what that was all about. <clears throat> they do take the name Cape Elizabeth off the side. I was going to say, did any of them say Cape Elizabeth on the side when you saw them in northern Maine? No, but apparently other districts don't follow that policy. <laughs> Next item, uh, I, consideration of policies for first reading. Um, Anne? Okay, the first policy we have is homework, policy IKB. This is a policy that we've been working on for several months. Um, we do currently have a homework policy, but the policy committee decided after um, discussing our current one that we wanted to really expand on it and provide more uh, detail and also we put together 
a couple of other sections, one of which is definition and purpose. The second is overarching philosophy. One of the things that I just wanted to say is that this, the, this two-page document that you have here, um, I think at the policy committee, we decided to actually break this into um, one page being the policy, the first page, and the second being IKBR, which would be guidelines. So we, one, one of the things that we would be changing is the second page would read file IKB-R. Mm -hmm. So guidelines can be changed without board approval. Um, anyway, so um, I guess we can just, are there any, I mean this is just a first, a first reading, so are there any questions or comments, discussion? One, one comment that I would make is you received at your table this evening a new copy of this because there was one thing left out of the changes and that is on the second page mm -hmm. under uh, grades one, uh, one through four. But uh, that was the recess? Yes. And yeah. what was supposed to have happened is that uh, section that says and recess should not be withheld from students who do not complete assignments. Mm -hmm. That should be struck from there. Mm -hmm. I just want to be very clear too, and I've talked to Tom about this and we talked about it at the meeting. It doesn't mean that there will be wholesale use of recess to make up work, but it does mean that it leaves that option particularly for third and fourth grade if it is absolutely necessary after they tried all other uh, uh, ways of going about this. Uh, that was one we missed when we typed up the form for you, so corrected it today. Tom, am I accurate on that? Yes. Yeah, that was something that we discussed quite a bit, using recess, at what we're talking about at the Pong Cove level, um, sort of as a, well, as a time to make up work versus taking it away as a punishment for not having done work. Exactly. And um, pretty much Tom clarified that it's really used as a positive opportunity to give students the time with teachers individually that they may not have otherwise and that teachers really don't use it as a punishment per se. Taking away recess, it's more as a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't know, would it be helpful just for people at home to see the guidelines that we, because people can, you know, if anybody has any comments or thoughts on this, they're welcome to. Um, email or call any members of the policy committee or of course Alan. And a question, I, I just want to clarify for myself, the correction that Alan just discussed, does that consistent with the recommendation of policy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So what, what the specific expectations and guidelines for grades one through four is up to 45 minutes per, and this is stress on the up to part, up to 45 minutes per weekday evening, including reading. Um, grades, um, yeah, this is reading That's a wrong. little it should bit. should be grades one this. through three. Actually, yeah. yeah it should be misinterpreted in my reads handwriting. pretty, yeah. we need to kind of clean Grade that one up. through three. Yeah. Yeah, and then, that's not clear in there, up to 30 minutes, and then grades four up to 45 minutes per weekday evening. Um, grade five up to one hour, grade six up to 90 minutes, grade seven and eight up to two hours, and grades nine through 12 up to one to three hours depending on course of study. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are, what is currently in this, in these guidelines that are being recommended. Any other questions or clarifications? No, and just to clarify for everyone, a first reading does not require a vote. Okay, so then moving on to the D policies. These are the fiscal policies, um, which I mentioned earlier that um, we reviewed with Pauline Aportria. And I, I, I don't think we really need to go through these one by one. Most of these don't have, several of these have no changes and others just really have a few minor changes. So are there any questions or clarifications needed? 
I don't see any, so I guess we can consider that a successful first reading. That will come back to us um, in the future for adoption. The next item is uh, public comment. Uh, you have two additions. Oh, that's J is project good. graduation mm -hmm. and K is budget schedule. We talked about it. Yeah, we did. And I don't know where I put my paper. So. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, project graduation request, but we already voted on that. We did that. Yep. Okay, so that's. Uh, we did vote on that. Already. Okay. And budget two schedule, FY 2007. Uh, I guess I need to. Uh, I need a motion to adopt that schedule. I don't think we've ever done that before. And I, I don't know that you need to vote on it, but it's a new information, and so I need to get some direction from you. What you have is two pieces. Number one, the picture of the school at the top is budget schedule from the town council and the uh, town manager uh, for budget submission dates, budget review, et cetera. Then what you have in front of you is the uh, actual budget schedule for 2006-2007 for the school board. Uh, what, we, what I wanted you to take a look at tonight is to see if you have any questions so that I can publish this or, or make any adjustments. On this one, you'll see the third one down is question mark, question mark, February 28th, 2006. Uh, I took this to the DLT this morning. Uh, the feeling was that that's a, that kind of fits the pattern you've done in the past where you've had a Tuesday night meeting, workshop meeting, uh, where you've discussed the budget overview, the athletic budget, the technology budget, and the professional development budget. Then you go to a Saturday workshop where you do the middle school, uh, Pond Cove, middle school, high school, community services, special ed district wide, and the wrap up. Uh, so the two questions that were, were asked at that meeting is number one, whether this date works for everyone and for the DLT it did, so I need to find out from the board. And the second piece is a suggestion at the meeting is, uh, this one says that the high school library, others are here in the town council chambers. And the question is whether you want to main, keep all of them in the, in the town council chambers or if you do want to do that one at the high school library. Uh, question of whether that's confusing for the public or not. Are, are you asking us to approve these dates right now? I, I would like to if I, what I need to do is to get this, to get this published to the community. Uh, either one of two ways, since you don't have to vote on this, uh, if, if there are questions, if you could get them back to me before Friday so that I can finalize this so we can, we can get this out to the public. Yeah, so I, would, I was going to ask if there was any press. I, you know, I'm guessing that some of us are not prepared with our date books yeah, and so calendars to, uh, to give an answer on that. And um, so I think, uh, yeah, a couple of days, and we're also missing two members tonight. So I think Friday, well, Friday is a holiday, so let's make it uh, Monday. Um, one of the questions I would have is um, the January 5th meeting, for example, with the council workshop, is that already carved in stone by the council? Because if it is, then we have no, you know. I would assume that that's, this is what has come to us from the council. So I would assume that that's what the town manager has had approved by the council. So we have no input at all into a meeting that we're supposed to attend. It's the way it's always been done. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know it's the way it's always been done. That's my point. Um, okay, well, I'll ask all of you to go home and get right to work on your calendar books and get back to Alan not later than Monday. Uh, Alan, I, you can write me down it is available. I think that's, uh, do we have anything else? Public comment, um, anyone? I don't see too many publics here, so. Um, school board agenda requests, 
Anyone? No? Upcoming meetings. I have to, my final meeting, and I didn't forget it. SAU Visiting Committee, November 7th, uh, 8, 8 o'clock throughout the day, and that's already happened. Policy Committee meeting Tuesday, November 15th, 2005, 12 noon, William H. Jordan Conference Room. Personnel Committee, Monday, November 28th, 2005, at 1 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. Substance Abuse Committee, Tuesday, November 15th, 2005, at 8 a.m. in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Finance Committee meeting, Tuesday, November 22nd, 2005, at 12.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. School Board Workshop, Tuesday, December 6, 2005, 7 p.m., Council Chambers. Um, and the topic, I believe, okay. is going... Is the Achievement Center. Is the so Achievement Center. invited to go to the high school That's right. uh, to have the meeting in the Achievement Center at the high school. I think it would probably be good to send out a reminder on the 5th um, to all of us. Um, that it's over at the high school and not here. And finally, school board business meeting, Tuesday, December 13th, 2005, at 7 p.m. in council chambers. There's no other business. Is there, is there something missing here? Should there be on this Monday, December 12th, is there a meeting with the town council to swear in the new board members? Is that, There's is a that town council on? meeting, and the new members of the school board are invited to come to that. Well, they're, they're supposed to come to that meeting to be sworn in. If they can't make it, then the town clerk uh, could either come to the school board meeting to swear them in, or they could be sworn in at a different time. That makes for a lot of confusion for the school board. That's right. But it's, that's the way it's... Because what, what we do need is an organizational meeting there. Right. Yes, yeah, and that needs to be... You know that according to the town charter, it's supposed to be after that swearing in. The town charter says that there's supposed to be an organizational meeting after that after swearing that in meeting on that Monday. Just as a point of information, the town council does some sort of uh, meeting on that before that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know whether or not we're held to charter regulations or not, but let, let me just review past practice for everyone. But I don't know, Mary, are you sure about that? Because I was just looking through that, and I thought that what it said, that there, there are two different clauses, and it is a little confusing, but I, what I interpreted it to say is that, it, that, that the organizational meeting of the school board should happen as close to that date as possible. Um, I was just quoting what the town clerk told me. I didn't read the. So it doesn't. Well, whatever, I mean, I'm sure it could be whatever the town charter yeah. says. I just don't know that we can expect. I mean, we just need to set an organizational day. Right. I think that what we need to do is um, just let me go over past practice for all of you because uh, I do have a plan. And past practice has been that. Um, School board members were essentially required to attend the town council meeting to be sworn in. And while the new town councilors took their seats for the first council meeting, the school board adjourned to the Jordan Conference Room where the sitting chair oversaw the elections and then turned the meeting over to the new chair, and in this case, vice chair. Um, to begin the process of appointments, which will differ somewhat than it has in the past. In the past, there were just appointments. There was conversation, but just appointments. Now I presume there's going to be conversation, appointment, and then affirmation. And we don't have, uh, that's right, Ann? Am I yeah. Well, I mean, it's recommendations, and then yeah. a vote. Yeah. It's not really appointments, it's recommendations. Well, I'm just, you know, whatever, whether it's a recommendation, it's still subject to, uh, it's still subject to uh, board affirmation. So, um, 
you know, that is, that is the existing practice and we don't have a policy that covers new practice. Um, Except I'd just like to say that the past two years, we didn't actually do that. The past two years, we didn't have um, the organizational meeting the night of the town council. So. Yeah, well, I, mean, I mean, it might the, be past, past practice. There's, there's nothing that says we have to have, right. you know, so yeah. far as I'm concerned, there's nothing that says we have to have an organizational meeting. You know, for all intents and purposes, um, it, if it suited the board, I could, I would chair December and there would be an entire period of time in which the board could decide on when to have that organizational meeting, but I sense that it's the, uh, the board's desire to get this done as soon as possible. But on the other hand, that can't happen until the people are sworn in. And I don't know if we can, you know, what the council says in terms of, you know, uh, why not swear in our new members uh, tomorrow, for example. They're elected. Um, I don't know if there's anything that prescribes when, they, when they're to take their seats. Is it in the town charter? It, it may be, but uh, I thought I had the town charter down pretty pat, and it turns out I didn't, so, and I don't have one in front of me. Anna, you have? Right here, no. Okay. I have one upstairs. So, there's a consideration, and I don't know if we want to beat it to death tonight, or, uh, mm -mm. you know, exchange opinions, and uh, we will be meeting, you know, we We'll be meeting uh, one more time uh, for sure with, that I'll be chairing, and that's the next workshop. So, uh, you know, it's up to the rest of the board, whatever works, and we can, you know, all implement it. Seeing nothing else, having... You know, actually, I do have one other thing. I, I forgot to... The, there is one other meeting that I just wanted to announce. That on November 28th, that we're going to be... That's the date that we're going to be getting together with the town council. To, oh, yes. Um, yeah. So the school board is going to be meeting with the town council. Um, what we're going to try to do, and this will be our first meeting, is to have quarterly... Um, sort of informal meetings with no real set agendas, just sort of an opportunity to do some information sharing between our two groups of, you know, stuff that might be coming up that we think might be pertinent, of interest to the other group, just to sort of keep each other abreast of things that might be coming down the pike that might affect, you know, the budget process or, or other things. So this is will be our first meeting of this sort and we're really hopeful that this will just really you know help to improve communication between the two two town bodies and we're all looking forward to that and you have to the time and place. it is from 8 to 9 30 and i'm assuming it's going to be in the conference room 8 to 9 30 in the morning I'm sorry for forgetting that, and uh, I want to acknowledge Ann for her legwork on this. She led the effort on the school board's side to uh, to get this initiative kicking. So hopefully some good things will come out of that. And now, having made more mistakes tonight than I did at my first meeting, we're adjourned. So this then.